All right, this is the FCMG podcast. Welcome back. We're here with Harley Newman. Today's date is November 23rd. It's about 7.37 p.m. 2019. Oh, yeah, 2019. Soon it will be 2020, and people will confuse us with a new show. Yes. Yeah, this is not 2020, but soon it will be 2020. No, we're more interesting. Not the show, the year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let me make sure that we're on uh, focus here. And then... Beautiful. Alrighty. We're good to go. Cool. Alright, so I've got my list here. A little talking agenda. Um, so I've got kind of actually two bullet points. I feel like you'd, you'd understand where this is going. So, the one says, first intro to Sideshow, and the other one says, influences Uncle Harley. <laughs> That's the, yeah, well. Okay. So where did it all start for you? Like, it's... I was born. <laughs> oh, okay. I, actually, I was not born. <laughs> you know, birth is a certain kind of process which I did not experience. And um, I was a month premature approximately 10 years after incubators had stopped becoming a sideshow. Oh, wow. For 40 years, incubators were on exhibit at Coney Island and other places as a way of hopefully rescuing premature children whose parents were desperate to have them. Yeah. In an age where most people thought that if a baby couldn't survive at that point, mm -hmm. it would have bad genes and bad children. Oh, and oh geez. Well, you know, whether I have bad genes or bad children, that's an entirely different discussion. But mm. by the time I came along, there were incubators. So I was slashed out of my mother. That was my first experience with slashers. Gotcha. <laughs> and um, thrown in an incubator, and they kept me there for a month. They didn't think I would live, and I fooled them. And I've been messing with doctors' heads ever since. <laughs> <laughs> the, the fun part, though, is that the town I was born in, the, the hospital was on the town line with the next town over. Okay. And the births were all registered in the next town over. But the surgical unit where I was born was in the town I was born in. Okay. So my birth records don't even have the town I was born in. They have the next town over. And I, I always oh, like that confusion. Okay. <laughs> I was named after my Uncle Harley. Uncle Harley was a botanist. Wasn't my bio uncle, but my grandfather was a botanist. And, and I still have his boxes of his slides. Oh, cool. Of his, his botanical samples. He was... He was one of the first people to be interested in um, coral. And he, my grandmother knew six languages already. Yeah. And she learned Russian just to double check his translation of Russian. Because oh, wow. the first person to do coral work was Russian. Not interesting. Oh, not that kind of coral. Yeah. <laughs> like oh, yeah, okay. Coral reefs and things. Reefs, gotcha. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. So, so this is, my this uncle is your Harley, grandfather. That was my grandfather and my uncle Harley. They were best friends, and my grandmother okay. and my, or my uncle and my grandfather would get together every Tuesday evening, and play music. And one, my grandfather played the piano, and my grandmother played the cello, and Uncle Harley played the violin. So that was their Tuesday evenings. And That's cool. after my grandfather died, Uncle Harley was. You know, a, an important figure in our family, yeah. even though he already had been. It was pretty cool. Uncle Harley was, he went to Harvard. He talked his way into Harvard, even though he didn't speak Greek and Latin. At the and time, that was like a requirement, he ended up, right? It, yeah, I mean, you, you couldn't do that at, the, at that point. And he ended up as the chairman of the botany department at the University of Michigan when all he had was a bachelor's degree. Okay. You couldn't do that. Nobody Jeez. did that, but he did. He was, and he was brilliant. He, he was president of the American Philosophical Society. So the guy was not a slouch, and he was yeah. interested in everything. <laughs> and in 1917, he was hired to go to Sumatra to investigate fungal diseases of rubber trees. And while he was there, 
he did his job. I, I, I've seen some paperwork that says this guy doesn't have confidentiality agreements. We have to keep him quiet. Oh, geez, yeah. Which is really funny. Okay, yeah. But uh, he did his job, but what he really interest, was interested in was getting adopted into a tribe of people who just stopped headhunting. So he got adopted into this okay. tribe, and, and you know, he was a brother to the shaman and the chief, and he went off on plant collecting expeditions with the shaman because he wanted to know what all of the plants were, period, anywhere, mm -hmm. and what their uses were and why they were harvested at different points in their life cycle and what the rituals were that were associated with that harvesting and processing. Okay. And what would be done with them afterwards. I mean, it's pretty, pretty humanitarian. Yeah. And um, so that's what he did. And then he told me when I was tiny, mm -hmm. polite versions of their children's stories. And later okay. on, I started looking into it myself and finding what yeah. the real versions were. And these were these <laughs> wonderfully gruesome tales. Usually the, a character called Mouse Deer is the trickster. Oh, okay. Mouse yeah. Deer is a, the smallest antelope, and they have mm -hmm. fangs or, you know, weird buck teeth, depending on how you want to describe them. <laughs> okay. But they're always a trickster. And, you know, so they outsmart tigers and they outsmart orangutans and boa constrictors and pythons and, and okay. everybody else in the jungle. And, and the most important thing to, to mouse deer is that he never be caught looking stupid. Right, yeah, okay. So he doesn't. He always finds a way to. Yeah, come out and, on top, and right? if he thinks somebody's going to make him look stupid, he makes sure they die <laughs> and get eaten. I mean, things oh, like right, that, because right. this is head hunting culture. Yeah, so, you know, I, I. He was my uncle. He died when I was about seven, eight years old. Mm -hmm. And um, I still remember him because he taught me that the world was not did not have the boundaries of my backyard. Yeah. It did not have boundaries of hedges and houses next door. It was a place of incredible mystery and incredible adventure. Stretch and you never knew it. You never culture. knew what you were going to find. It was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's too cool. Yeah. That's it's so like he kind of he kind of expanded your your knowledge of the world and sort of made you um like gave you that curiosity to look into well curi more than what curiosity you're told. is something i have in spades and that's okay. probably going to be the death of me so yeah, i feel like that's always been a part of you <laughs> oh yeah but he encouraged me and he did it very very gently mm -hmm. it wasn't obtrusive he encouraged me and uh, and the the things i remember about him became eventually very focal to a lot of the ways that I look at the world okay. and a lot of the kind of lore that I love to explore. Mm -hmm. So I've always liked folk tales, mythology. I don't see a huge difference between the two. You yeah. Know? And, you know, I probably have 500 different books of folk tales and mythology upstairs in my library somewhere. That's and I've read all of them multiple times, and yeah. <laughs> that probably wouldn't have happened without my Uncle Harley. And now, you know, I have come to, I've done a lot more research. I've gone and found the artifacts that he collected that got donated to museums. Mm -hmm. I've held them in my hands. I've oh, looked them cool. and I understand what all of these artifacts were used for. Yeah. I understand the stories behind them. I've gone into the mythology of the people he lived them like with. The, the context, the culture. And oh, all yeah. That. yeah. And, and I understand why his people hunted heads. Jeez, that's too cool. Which is very, very cool stuff. You know, yeah. it's very contrary to the beliefs of our culture. Yeah, and and that's a healthy thing too because it it makes me realize that our culture is only a very small part of the world. Mm -hmm. Interesting.
And all of these things informed me when we'd start talking about sideshow and presentation. Yeah. Because I don't necessarily have to lecture an audience about all of it, but it all comes into play somewhere. Right. You know, okay. because I'm presenting thoughts from other times and places and peoples. Yeah. And you're... giving them a, a, a rather different context. And because of me being who I am, there's usually some clown in it because. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started really <laughs> performing professionally in 1972, and it was as a clown. Yeah. And um, I've always been a contrary, and I have no reason to stop now. <laughs> None. Life would be dull. I can't even imagine such a thing. So, like, where did that, where did that bridge kind of happen from, like, this, this curiosity of exotic stories and, and all this stuff into actual sideshow because I feel like this like sideshow is very is something very specific it's a performance art it's and yet it connects with so much so it's like there's a million different ways to get involved so everyone's story is kind of different like how what how did that um, how did that switch happen for you when I went to college because that was part of what was expected in my family mm. um, I mean you know a lot of the women in my family had had advanced degrees since the 1830s. There was no way I could Ow. escape college, even though I didn't Jeez. want to go for, at that time. Right. I wanted to go wandering or work or something. I didn't, I yeah. didn't know where I wanted to be. But that was the expectation. It was, that was the expectation, and I, I felt stuck in it, and I didn't know how to say no. Wow. So I went to college, and at the time, the only thing I'd ever wanted to be was a doctor. Yeah. And I discovered very quickly that I couldn't figure out chemistry. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, physics I could picture because I could see dimensions in my head and the way forces work and the way things influenced each other and the directions that were involved in the three dimensions, yeah, yeah. And the various dimensions. That sort of spatial awareness. Yeah, it was a spatial awareness. And if I had learned if I had figured out how to learn chemistry as a spatial awareness, it would have been different. Interesting. But that wasn't what the way it was being taught at the time, and right. I didn't okay. get it. So I failed it. I failed basic chemistry a couple times, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and in my first semester of college, you know, in the middle of failing chemistry, yeah, I organized a trip for my dormitory floor to go to the circus. Oh, cool. <laughs> and, you know, we went to see Ringling Brothers. This was fall of 1970. Yeah. And it was about an hour drive. We took two cars. There were 17 of us. After the first 12, 13 miles, one of the cars broke down, so all the rest of us piled into the other car. Did you just say you fit 17 people in two cars? No, I think it was 15, because two <laughs> people stayed with the one car. <laughs> and we went to see the circus, and we had these seats, in the, we had the cheapest seats in the whole Coliseum, and they were yeah. way, way up at the top. <laughs> and that year, Ringling Brothers featured a clown named P.O. Nock. The okay. Knox family has been in business for, I don't know, 400 years or something like that. And wow. the current generation is still incredibly famous in the circus world. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they deserve to be. They're amazing. P.O. was an old Swiss clown with incredible skills. That sounds interesting. He had, during his career... He did tightrope walking over, you know, right over the lions. Yeah. Oh, geez. Whatever. <laughs> he did that. And he did the most magnificent comedy tightrope act I've ever seen, period. <laughs> so, you know, he took a step and he stepped on his foot and then his foot was stuck and he couldn't get out of it. And then another place in the routine, I think he lost his pants. And <laughs> it was just... Sublime, and then he did another act that's a, a signature of his family called sway pole. And on a sway pole is this tall pole. They might be fifty feet tall or seventy-five or something. Wow. Yeah. And they're flexible. Okay. So Pio's pole was decorated like an old-fashioned gas lamp, and he was the lamp lighter. 
<laughs> so he came out and shinnied up this pole about 50 feet, 60 feet. I don't know. It was a long way down. Yeah. And when he and the top of the pole was the gaslight. Yeah. So he got on. He climbed up on top of this gaslight and started looking around. And then he pulled a bottle out of his pocket. Can't do drunk acts these days easily, but it was a drunk act. <laughs> Took a swig and put the bottle back in his pocket. Then he started swaying. And every time he came across the the, the top of the sway, the arc. He'd take another swig from the bottle and get wilder and wilder until he was <laughs> wailing all over this place, and holding on for dear life and almost falling off. And it was crazy. And and I had never seen anything like this before, at the time. <laughs> and I was in the top balcony in the front row. Yeah. And at the farthest amount of swing, he was within 10 feet of me. Oh, my gosh. It was this delightful, amazing line between complete comedy and abject terror. <laughs> and I've never seen anything be like it before or since. And a couple months That's later, incredible. after that, I thought, oh, I could be a clown. So I got every book out of the library and interlibrary loan that I could find. Okay. It meant a total of about maybe seven books at the time. It wasn't, this was not a serious subject for writing at the time, so there wasn't much on it. <laughs> and I used all of those books and whatever I could think of and wrote a term paper, which I found that my professor at the time turned into a book. I recently found that out. Oh, wow. So oh, jeez. And uh, don't ask me to trust academia. I don't. <laughs> it's not about learning most of the time. So I, I, I wrote a paper, and then I used a version of that paper in almost every class I had for the rest of my college career because it was easy. Nice. And I thought I remember you telling me this. And I started, and then I, you know, a little ways on, I got a unicycle and I figured out how to ride it badly. Yeah. <laughs> and then I got better and better and better. I, I went to the grocery store near where I lived and juggled fruit. And after I, a couple weeks after I finally figured out how to keep three things going, they started packaging the fruit. Oh, jeez. That sucked. <laughs> that totally sucked. And I will never forgive those people for it. They took your practice material. They took my practice material. But I, <laughs> I could keep three things going. And that, that's as much as I ever got in juggling. Yeah. Actually, now, if I want to think of it seriously, juggling makes me want to throw up. And <laughs> then I do, and the things come down, and you're, I'm supposed to catch them, and it never seems to work very well. <laughs> oh so <laughs> juggling for me is a thing of bad jokes. <laughs> And I made it through college. I don't know how. Yeah. Barely. Skin <laughs> of my teeth. Less than that. And I'd started performing. And I was doing birthday parties and, you know, promotions at shopping centers and things. And one day I went to pay my bill at the local newspaper after a show. So I had makeup and costume on. I had a bag full of props. All my right, clown yeah. props fit in a laundry bag at the time. Yeah. And every show I do for the last 40, however, almost 50 years, my bag, I still have a bag, and it's a laundry bag, but now it has pockets inside so that when I reach in, I know exactly where I'm going to find each thing that I want nice. when I want it. Yeah, okay. So if I want the horn, I know when, where it's going to be. If I want the dead rubber fish, I know exactly where <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, you know, if I want 40 feet of rope with bananas tied to it, I know exactly how where it's going to be. And I'm, <laughs> I'm going to know that it's not tangled up so that it comes out one banana at a time. <laughs> knock, knock, but who's there? Banana. Knock, knock, who's there? Banana, etc. cetera. <laughs> and, um, do you have an orange at the end? No. <laughs> Why would I do that? Just because it's the joke. <laughs> no, who says it's an apple? Who says it's an orange? Who raised their hand twice? <laughs> Boom! Oh no, I've reached the end of my rope. 
<laughs> it's stupid. That's what it is. It's what makes people laugh. Dumb stuff makes people laugh. Dumb stuff works, that's for Including sure. Including me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And if I can't entertain myself with it, I should just get off the stage. <laughs> so Don't I was be. doing all this stuff, and I went to pay the, the bill at the newspaper. It was like 10 bucks a week or something like that. And I okay. think I made more than that, but not necessarily whole lots, because this is... 1974 or five, somewhere around there. Okay. And um, they took my picture, leaving the building, going out the door on okay. the unicycle. Yeah. Because the unicycle was my mode of transportation at the time. The local police hated it. They tried to <laughs> stop me all the time. And whenever they'd stop me, they'd say, it's a bicycle. And I'd say, no, it only has one wheel. Yeah. And then if I'd see them coming on one side of the street, I'd just flip over to the other side of the street and start weaving in and be out between parked cars and going on sidewalks. And <sighs> I don't talk about that too often. I'm not very civilized. It's a veneer. So... They took my picture, and all of a sudden, I got started getting phone calls. Like, you know, Associated Press called me up, and they wanted cool. to interview me. So this yeah. interview, and I didn't, I did not know how to be interviewed. I didn't know how to do PR. I didn't know anything like that. <laughs> it was a completely foreign territory, and there was no one to help. And all of a sudden, this article went out all over the country. And I know that it went to almost every newspaper in the country, and a whole lot of them published it. And I didn't know how to cope with that. Yeah. I had no clue. I had no management skills. I had no publicity skills. So you were kind of thrust into the spotlight. In uh, that thrust way. into a spotlight. And I got a call from some guy who was a foreman in a ladder factory in Muscatine, Iowa. Interesting. <laughs> There's a combination. Yeah. Well, he owned a baseball team. He okay. owned what was left of one of the old Negro League teams, the Indianapolis Clowns. And he offered me a job as their mascot for the 1975 season. That's a... Wow. And I took it. Okay. And the deal was I was supposed to get $25 a game. Mm-hmm. And ten dollars a day, I think, or no, five dollars a day food money. Nice, like a per diem. Yeah, that was a per diem, and then they were going to take care of all the the travel expenses. Interesting. Okay. So, I didn't know how to play baseball. I, nobody would have me on their team when I was a little kid because I didn't know how to throw. I didn't know how to catch. Yeah. You know, I didn't know how to juggle, and that wasn't particularly relevant to baseball anyway. Oh, look, he's juggling three balls. You know, hit him with the bat, you know. That, yeah. was, that was how a lot of kids looked at me, I'd hit him with the bat. And um, so I here I had this job, and I, I took it. We traveled all over the place in an old beat totally beat to shit airport limousine <laughs> there were more of us in the limo than there was room for us we had to carry all of our equipment at the same time all the baseball equipment all the team members got their five dollars a day per diem for food money which meant okay. that there wasn't enough to feed them so you know there were a number of them that had developed a wonderful method of of leaving the restaurant right before the bills came to us ah oh, gotcha and that always made me very angry but, you know, I got to sneak up behind the umpire and light a string of firecrackers and put it under his butt. <laughs> and since they never knew what was going on until the firecrackers went off, they'd start jumping around, getting all pissed <laughs> off and twitching and getting angry. And, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, meanwhile, however many people there were, it might be 50, it might be thousands. Yeah. You know, because you never knew what kind of team we were going to be playing. All of these people would be laughing their butts off because the umpire was their enemy. <laughs> it was tremendous fun. And That's I'd sneak a Nerf ball in my armpit and go up to bat on the unicycle. And I'd, and 
you know, get a home run, almost always. Yeah. <laughs> and I had a six foot wooden bat, nasty <laughs> thing. Oh my God. That I'd go up to bat with when it was my turn. And all I had to do was get that thing somewhere in the strike zone and whatever it hit was gone. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you could usually get about a double out of that. I learned to play baseball finally. <laughs> oh my gosh. And um, then it broke. The bat broke. It's like, you know, here's the handle, right here, straight across, oh, jagged. Geez. Which meant because it was jagged, it you would hold itself together. Put it back in, yeah. So I could go like this oh, Lord. and swing and hit the ball, and then the bat would break, and then I'd take off running. It was so much fun. That's beautiful. <laughs> and it got left, the bat got left behind in liberal Kansas, I think. Oh. Liberal, yeah. Why do I have a feeling and, that uh, it's not too liberal, Kansas? <laughs> Kansas is not that a liberal a place, no. No, no, okay, no. interesting. <laughs> but I like it. I liked I liked Kansas a lot. Yeah. We drove back and forth from Colorado to eastern Kansas every night for all, for two and a half weeks because it saved the team owner from having to pay for motels. Oh, wow. And when we would get a motel, there would be 15, 16 of us total <laughs> and two rooms. Nice. So double mattresses, the mattresses went off, people got on the springs and the mattresses, and that was how we would do motelling. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Then the next, so that was one season. I never got paid for the whole season. The ladder factory foreman, let's just say he ripped me for about, I don't know, I don't remember exactly how much it was, but it was a good quarter of what I was supposed to get paid. Oh, jeez. Which tells me that he wasn't making any money out of it. Yeah. The team still exists, not obviously in the Negro Leagues. And um, one of the guys who was on the team at the time, Dave Clark, I haven't seen him since then. He was short. He'd had polio as a kid. He walked on crutches. Gotcha. But when you put him on the pitcher's mound, you could give him two balls, and he'd throw two strikes at the same time. Whoa. So he could get people out like that, because nobody ever knew wow. what to do with him. Yeah, good Lord. So he's got, he's got the team. I think he's down in Florida somewhere. Interesting. And, uh, yeah. So then the next season, I joined a circus. So this is a long story in gotcha. a way, because yeah. we're, we're doing... We're being it's the the steps to the sideshow in the circus, and, yeah. And my first year on a circus, I was officially the special assistant to the manager, so I was a glorified gopher. Okay. Which meant I had to do everything. Yeah. In a circus, you do lots of jobs. Period. Yeah. You can't not. There's just so much work to be done that you have to do a lot. Mm -hmm. So I helped with all the lead stock, the yak, the llamas, the camel. I had a special relationship with the camel because I had to lead him all the time, <laughs> including in the spec. Spec is the opening spectacle number where you do okay. a big parade around the circus ring. And gotcha, yeah. His name was John, and he had the stinkiest breath in the world. <laughs> Camels do that because they recycle their urine. They, they live in an, an arid environment, so they can't just pee uh, out all of their moisture. Right. So their urine gets recycled through some glands somewhere in the back of their mouth, and their breath is disgusting. Ooh. And he was not, camels are kind of ornery. And I've heard that, They actually. have big yeah. feet. They have really round feet because yeah, you know big pads right yeah. so they can walk on sand and then and when they're walking on the, and their their feet expand a little bit when they're walking on something that isn't sure-footed oh cool just because it's cool they have amazing feet yeah so if they're in a bad mood they'll jump up and down and they'll try to stomp you with their front feet oh <laughs> jesus and i can't speak for the kind of training that he'd had before um, animal training has changed a lot in yeah. the last 50 years. It's, a, it's amazing. You know, before that time, a lot of it was based on the idea that you had to tame the ferocious jungle creatures. And so you made yeah. noises and you hit them and you were mean and you had to beat them into submission. Yes. And over the last 50 years, that's disappeared almost completely. 
Yeah. And okay. animals are trained with love and affection and treats. Good. It really is. Yeah. So I used Positive to... Positive reinforcement. Yeah. I used to give him carrots. Nice. <laughs> and um, he liked that. It, but he would get in a bad mood and he'd start jumping up and down and trying to stomp on me with his front feet because he didn't... I, maybe he didn't like his music. I don't know. Hmm. Elephants love their music. Lions love their music. Camels are just ornery. <laughs> and um, they'd be good Republicans. <laughs> And um, and so I, you know, I, I you know, the, what you do then is you hold on to his halter and you hold on for dear life because otherwise they're going to run away. Yeah. And that means that you pull their head down so that if they're trying to stomp you with their front feet, they're going to kick themselves in the head if they keep it up. Yeah. So they stop. Yeah. <laughs> it's. These things you learn in life. I mean, I've never <laughs> u- learned that. I've never used that skill since then. Yeah, that's almost fifty years ago, or however many, <laughs> forty-five. And uh, you know, I still would know how to deal with one, <laughs> and that's I'd a... still give them carrots. <laughs> so, lead stock. Uh, I did lots of publicity work. Okay. There were people coming to the circus lot. I was the one that would give them a tour and tell them all the things that were going on. And look, here's how they put up the tent. Now they're putting up the seats. Let's walk around okay. here and see what the animals look like. That's the gorilla, because we had a gorilla. He had oh, wow. his own private semi-trailer. I used to yeah. play with him every day, you know, because did he get out? No. Did I go in? No. But that does not stop communication. Right. And Good. I liked him immensely. <laughs> he was a pleasure. That's incredible. And he oh, apparently wow. liked me too. And he was a very shy gorilla. Yeah. Um, could tell many stories about him. <laughs> and um, so I would give tours of the circus lot. And then okay. there was a sound truck, you know, a big step van with loudspeakers on top, hooked to an eight track tape that had circus music in the background wow. with somebody talking about, well, it was just circus music, and then I had a microphone, and I was supposed to talk about where you would see the circus, what the times were, okay. and where. And, and so that was, that was part of my job, and then you know, help, helping during the show. Yeah. The circus I was with, Hoxie Brothers, had a sideshow. It was run by a gentleman named Roger Boyd, Jr., Okay. And his wife was in it, and his, a bunch of other folks on the show were in it. And so there was the. And I lived in a trailer the first year with a couple of the other sideshow performers. Very odd people. <laughs> I'm being polite. And um, I started learning things about how to train and. I wasn't really interested at the time, but I paid attention. Yeah, okay. And you know, because I still wanted to be a clown. And I was one of those people who, when you would walk onto the circus midway and you would see the sideshow off to one side, there'd be somebody there standing talking on a microphone trying to talk people into buying tickets. And that was part of my job. That's, there's a name for that job. It's a talker. It's a an talker. outside talker. Now, gotcha. I was not the manager. Roger was the manager, so he got okay. to be on the stage. Yeah. You know, and people from the show would come out and be on the stage and okay. maybe show off a little bit of what they were going to do. It's called a ballet. It's like a tease, right? It's a, it's a tease. Yeah. And so they would do the ballet, and then Roger would go inside to manage the show and run the show inside the tent. And that would be, and then the rest, you know, me talk people and, and tickets, sell them tickets, take their money, get them in the show. Gotcha. They'd get to see all the animals, they'd get to see the gorilla, they'd get to see the sideshow go awesome. on. <laughs> and I got to describe all the strange, odd, unusual people gathered from the corners of the earth for the year education and entertainment right here, right now. Now is the time. If you're in line, you're in time. Come in right now. <laughs> you still got it, jeez. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I do. I feel like if we put a, put you out front, you'd be I, just as comfortable. I'd be just as comfortable. It's, <laughs> it's rather delightful. It's it's an interesting challenge to see somebody from you know 
100 feet away, 150 feet away, and know exactly how to talk them to talk them so that they were going to buy a ticket. What to say to bring them in the door. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> I guess it's a power trip of sort, but I never thought of it yeah. as a power trip. It was just, it was a challenge. What? That's, that's such like a practical really study of, of human psychology. That's oh, cool. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's a very practical study because you have to give people something they want when they don't know what they want. That's incredible, yeah. And you have to present it in such a way that all of a sudden they discover what they want and they're, they have a feeling of being compelled to do what you wanted them to do in the first place. Interesting. Interesting. So you, you, you know, so if you if you stand there and say, "Come here, buy my ticket," you know, they're yeah, that's not going to work. Right? Yeah, it's it's too aggressive an approach. Like but, you gotta, but you know, did you ever see a gorilla? No, you've got five kids right there. They've never had the opportunity to see this gorilla. Let me tell you about this gorilla. Yeah, his arms. He's got a seven foot arm span from fingertip to fingertip. This gorilla is a strong mongo. He's as strong as the entire front line of the Dallas Cowboys football team. I never <laughs> mentioned that the Dallas Cowboys cheated at the time, or that was my opinion. I always <laughs> thought they cheated every game at that time. But I'm not a football fan, so what do I know? And um, you know, but it, all he eats is fruits and vegetables. He's a vegetarian. You can see him inside. You know, of course, because constantly going through the shtick is inside right now, alive. Now's the time. Go now. Yeah, urgency. Uh, urgency. It's like get get on this. You have to come and see this. Yeah, you, this is your gonna, opportunity. This is the thing your friends and neighbors have been talking about all week. Doesn't matter that we got into town that morning and we we're going to be gone the next yeah. morning. Oh wow! This is the thing they've been telling you about all week, and you have to come right now, or you're going to miss the opportunity. That's such an important thing, like setting up that urgency. Yeah. Oh, wow. here's where you're going to see the fire eater he eats fire. He spits fire. He shaves with a blowtorch. <laughs> this is the place you're going to see the swords follow or two feet of solid steel dropping down that gentleman's mouth into the pit of his stomach. Can you imagine eating a meal like that? I did not think so. Oh, jeez. You know, etc. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is where, like, it, it was kind of like the... Um, like the frying pan. Like it, oh, it's it, definitely. I, didn't, I wouldn't have realized it was a frying pan at the time. You know, I went to a circus, and here I was a guy with a college degree uh, in a biz, having attempted to enter a business where people look at that kind of education. Yeah. Like that's, a de that's almost like a detriment. Yeah. It's a, it was a detriment, you know, and there were a lot of people who assumed that I was going to have no skills and no work ethic. Gotcha. And so I made a point of trying to work people under the table. Yeah. Prove them wrong, right? Yeah. And I worked hard. I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, I'd do it again in some ways. Yeah. Though I'm much older and I wouldn't be as physically capable as I was 45 years ago. <laughs> but, you know, they, they, they eventually they put me on, for example, loading the prop truck at night. So when they're tearing down the tent and tearing gotcha. down all the the equipment and the seats and everything, okay, all of these it's it's very meticulous. People people call politics a sideshow or a circus as an insult, and they have no clue <laughs> what they're talking about. Yeah. These are ignorant, ignorant people. No matter how much money they make for their news jobs or their political jobs, I. That's a compliment. Calling it's them a, a circus. Compliment. Yeah. Because a circus is one of the most organized things that exists on the face of the earth. I was going to say, yeah. So they put me on loading the prop truck. So, you know, all the equipment from the trapeze and the tightrope and the this and that and the other thing and the ring curbs and the poles from the tent and this. Jeez. And right. when I got that job, the person who did it before would take about an hour, 20 minutes. And I got it done consistently in 24 minutes. Wow. Wow. Jeez. Because I had a sense of order and I was willing to work my butt off. Yeah. Process and motivation. Process and motivation. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's a good way of phrasing it. Yeah. So I started learning all about Sideshow. And then, you know, a few years later, I'd gone into working in mental health and I gotten another degree and mm -hmm. I got frustrated and Oof. I felt like I was losing 
my sense of integrity. Yeah. And um, I started thinking, well, what what else can I do? I feel like that's a that's a common line with like creative professionals where you get to a point where yeah. you're just not fulfilled creatively and you have yeah. to do something. To well, and and in our society we don't value sabbatical leaves. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a horrible horrible mistake because mm-hmm. one of the best things you can do is take a break from something you're beating your head against yeah. and do something else for a while. And then you come back and you have a fresh outlook and it's like, "Oh, wait." And your problem-solving skills improve and, yeah. and you see different things that you never saw before and different ways of weaving them together. That was so a radicals are important. Yeah, that was a that was a serious skill that like um like learning instruments taught me where if you're if you're really having trouble like learning a piece you literally just stop for like two three days just give it a rest yeah and then you come back to it and like your subconscious will work through these things without you actively engaging with them you know like it'll work through the problems in the background and then when you have the opportunity to actually like put that into practice then you can you can actually bridge that gap. You can find things that fit that you were never aware of before. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. can finally make those connections in a in a new yeah. way. It's important. Yeah, that's for sure. That's really cool. So I'm I'm ready to quit mental health. You know, I'd been working with mostly street people who were thrown out of the state hospitals at the time Ronald Reagan was taking the funding away and the hospitals yeah. were closing. I loved the people. I couldn't stand the, some things about the job. And I just thought, what am I going to do? You know, I'm, I'm a terrible juggler, just for the bad jokes, you know. <laughs> and do I want to go back to the circus? I really did. Yeah. A lot. I, you know, when I die, I want everybody to go to the circus. And when the circus is down, it has to be a tent show. And they've torn the ring down and torn down the tent for the night, throw my ashes in the ring, and that's that would make me happy knowing that that was going to happen. But so I, but I couldn't join a circus because you know I bought a house. I was being kind of middle roots. American, and did my head fit that? I suppose I don't know. Yeah. But what was I going to do? You know, I. I I wasn't set up to go on the road, and I also knew how much money I would make as a clown in a circus. Yeah, okay. Absolute garbage. So I started thinking, I I was intrigued by escapes, the art of escapes. Oh, okay. And I started thinking about all the the sideshow lore that I had absorbed. Yeah. And I thought, well, I had friends who were doing street performing, which wasn't popular. I had friends who were getting careers in stand-up comedy, okay, which was just beginning to be popular. Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, but I've got my own style. And I didn't like the traditional style of presentation in Sideshow. Because mm-hmm. it's you know, part of it's based on telling people what you're going to do ahead of the time that you know it's, it's based on this mid 1900s presentation style. Okay. So, in, entertaining on Sunday was illegal. Blue laws because right. that okay. was the Lord's day. You yeah. didn't mess with it. Day of rest. Day of rest. Yeah. So there were a lot of shows that would continue to entertain on Sundays. Okay. But the person who did the presenting the MC, so to speak, hmm. would be called a professor. Okay. And the style of entertainment was based on being kind of pseudo-educational. Interesting. So because okay. it was education or cultural, it was okay to do it on a Sunday. Yeah. So a show could play every day, which is the goal gotcha. anyway. It took on a different sort of like context yeah. in that way. Yeah. So... The style was more oriented toward telling a story about a little bit of story of the story about the performer, and then they're going to demonstrate their special skill for you. Gotcha. Yeah. So let's say 
there was uh, there would be a woman with hands coming out of her shoulders. Interesting. They would say, and look at the sewing she does, and then there was she would be sewing something. Yeah. Or, you know, one of my friends was a midget, and at one point for a long time in her career, that's part of her act because there was always an extra special sale deal of some sort. Yeah, Most okay. of the performers had something to sell. She would sell, because she was the world's smallest woman, she would sell Bibles that big. <laughs> you know, which made all yeah. kinds of things okay. And she had a wicked sense of humor. It was amazing. That's fantastic. And everybody had something to sell. And it, okay. Most of them had pitch cards, which is what sort of like what we would call a postcard nowadays. Okay. With a picture of them on one side and then a little blurb about them on the other side, where they were born, normal parents, blah, 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 blah. So that was, that was for, anyway, the freaks, who were kind of the royalty of Sideshow. And then there were the working acts, who were the people who did things that you could learn. Like skill-based acts. Skill-based acts. Okay. Um, sword swallowing, fire eating, beds of nails, gotcha. whatever. I mean, you know, you can learn a bed of nails in under five minutes. You can learn an entire traditional act, and yet, you know... Oh, this is the fuck here from India, blah, 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 blah. And then the talker would go on, the inside talker. Outside talker is outside the show talking into buying people right. into buying tickets. Yeah. Inside talker is inside the show doing the MC work. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. And uh, the inside talker would be, you know, oh, and you'd go on for a couple minutes about the fuck here from India and some total nonsense about what kind of practices they had. Their social lives, their religious lives, how they were different than us, but they weren't threatening. Oh no! <laughs> and um, and then somebody would do a standard bed of nails out. They'd lie on a bed of nails. They'd have somebody stand on them, making maybe break a rock on their oh, belly geez. with a sledgehammer. Or, yeah. Or eventually cinder blocks because they're much easier to be predictable with than a rock. And uh, that was the act. Wow. Oh, we have the sword swallower. Here is the man who's going to take two feet of steel. You know, and there's a whole shtick that goes along with presenting an act in the traditional way. Right, okay. But it all involves telling the audience what's going to happen ahead of time. Yeah, and like I, you, you set up the expectation and then you fulfill the expectation. Yeah. As someone with a theater degree okay. and a different sense of performing logic, I found that offensive, and I still do. <laughs> so when I see people doing that, I want to throw them off the stage. I want to do them close to bodily injury because yeah. they're completely ignoring what they're doing. They, they don't understand performance. They've learned it from somebody else. They've learned an act from, some, from a teacher, and they're doing it the way they learned it. Yeah. And I understand that, but it's lazy. It's intellectually dishonest, and it's terrible theater. Yeah. Well, I, I mean... So, okay, well, we're talking sword swallowing for a second. You know, okay. I, I eventually learned that skill. Yeah. Not because I wanted to swallow swords, <laughs> but because I, I, I was aware of a different kind of theatrical logic. Mm -hmm. Why would somebody shove something that, you know, so that, okay... This is talking something through. Why would somebody shove something down their throat? They wouldn't. But everybody in the audience, and the audience is important because you always need them to identify with you somehow. Mm -hmm. Everybody in the audience knows what it's like to... <coughs> everybody knows what that's like. Yeah, yeah. So if I were to take a drink of water and start choking on it, yeah. <laughs> pound my chest and heimlich myself. There's a certain theatrical logic. The, the audience understands exactly what's going on. Yeah. Point A, point B, point C, all of these things make sense. They never have to stop to ask a question. There's never a break in the, in the emotional experience right. they're yeah. undergoing. And then, you know, I grab a plunger, <laughs> a toilet plunger, and hold it up to my face and everybody goes, eh, 
it because I just violated their expectation of the world. Yeah. And then I just say no, which reconfirms their sanity. Turn it around and shove the handle down my throat. <laughs> that stops me from choking. It surprises the hell out of people. Yeah. And because of it's me, it's really, really funny. That's why. That yeah. was why I learned sword swallowing. You know, now that's only part of a whole longer routine that I haven't done, even though I haven't put on stage, even though I started working it through probably 15 years ago or more. Yeah. That's, and that's really interesting how that, that breaks down the why of why well, yeah. you would do something like that. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Yeah. And then it, it's sort of like in doing that, you suspend the disbelief of the audience. Or like they believe that okay, this they makes sense for them. To they do. don't have time to think of something else because I've yeah. just hit with them with an alternate reality that makes sense. You know, okay. Other example, um, over the time of my career, I've changed a lot of the way I look at showmanship. Okay. Right now, instead of starting something really noisy and attracting attention. Yeah. Because the first thing you do when you go on stage is you have to take a disparate group of people, whether there's 10 people or 10,000 or 75,000, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But I've worked audiences that range from about seven people up to about 75,000. Wow. And that's not counting television. But television, yeah. they don't give you any feedback. It's just yeah. this glass eye and people in the audience are MCs twitching. You know? Yeah, it's all prediction it's based. All prediction it's, based. Oy. And and pretending. But I forgot what I was gonna say. Something about working the audience. Yeah, you're taking this this huge disparate group of people oh, and you're the first thing you have to do as a performer is take this disparate group of people. Yeah. People who come to a show in ones or twos or tens. Yeah, individual and groups. There like are individual groups who have n the thing they have in common is that they're there. Right. But the thing that you have to do as a performer is to take all of their emotional experience and turn it into one unit. Oh, we are empathic characters, yeah. creatures. So you have to f know how to make that audience have that sense of empathy with one another. Yeah, give them that you shared experience. You have to give them an experience that's shared, a thing that they're going through all at the same time. Yeah. If you went to a, Ro a Rolling Stones concert, they wouldn't start with a slow ballad. Yeah. They would start with something that would make the entire audience want to get up and dance. Absolutely, yeah. They wouldn't say a word. They would just start slamming out the music. And then after mm -hmm. they'd done something that, that after a a piece of, or a song or two, mm -hmm. then they'd say hello. Yeah. And the same concept exists in film where it's like you start with conflict or you start with something that that draws the audience in and makes them ask a question. Something like, that why demands is attention. Happening? Exactly. It doesn't allow you to look the other way or have an, an emotional experience yeah. that isn't parallel to what the creator of that that artistic environment it, it puts wants. your audience in like a position where they have to you want them to demand an explanation from you yeah and then you give them that explanation as your show you give them the explanation continues interesting so I used to start a show with fire eating because every, not everybody had seen it but everybody understood the idea of it and yeah. then at the end of my fire eating routine I do is this spitting fire that goes one fireball that way and another one that way and then another one over my head and I keep it going for it seems like forever and yeah. the, the torches I've taken it out of the fire so all of this huge flame is going based entirely on what's coming out of my mouth yeah yeah and that's such an impressive people might not have seen that before but they sort of <laughs> understand that it happens so when they see it and they're sitting a hundred 10 feet away and they can feel the heat of it, yeah. it gives them a completely different reality and it snaps them right into that place I want them to be. Yeah, that's Which fantastic. is emotionally in the exact same place. Yeah. Lately, I've been playing with it differently. And instead of being noisy, I, 
I along the way I had some I was fortunate to have some master classes from mm. Marcel Marceau and from Jacques Lecoq, great mime trainers both. And while they didn't necessarily change my physical awareness and physical movement because I already had a sense of that from doing cl circus clowning. It's a yeah. certain style of relating to the world through your body. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, I, I got a different idea of what mime is. And instead of it being somebody with a balloon or somebody in a box or trying to get over a wall, you know, I learned that mime is using your body to show people what's going through your head. Yeah, okay. Totally different frame of reference. It's like an extreme form of just pure body language. It's just body language. And yeah. so instead of ending a show with something that was big and flashy, mm -hmm. I've been experimenting with quiet endings that demand attention. And instead of starting a show with something big and flashy, fire, right. I've been doing something that just commands attention. So if I'm introduced and I come out on stage and I start to talk and can't, mm. and all of a sudden there's a tennis ball in my mouth, <laughs> and there's no way it could have gotten there, <laughs> yeah. and I take it out and have a response to it, you know, the entire audience is like, what the? <laughs> and then, Another one comes out. <laughs> you know, what can I do? I can play with it. I can exactly. myself googly eyes. Yeah. And then I've got two, and then all of a sudden another one comes out. It's almost entirely silent, and yet it demands the same kind of attention. Mm -hmm. And because I have a sense of theatrical logic, after I've got the third one out, and, uh, you know, I have to start complaining about how terrible they taste. So... <laughs> You know, a little bit of breath spray, and then I discover I like the breath spray, and I like a lot of the breath spray. And I spit a little fireball, and ah, oh, no, I burned the hair in my nostrils. Have you ever burned your nose hairs before? Mm. That's going to stink for three days. <laughs> so, you know, grab a fan, an electric fan, and... You know, and I end up stopping the fan with my tongue, and, you know, and it just goes on and on and on and on. So that each thing that I do becomes the introduction to the next logical phrase. Right. Yeah. And you know that to me, that's what storytelling is. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people say storytelling. You know, and and this is the first time I've mentioned storytelling, but this is something I'm really big on. Yeah, that is a huge focus Storytelling doesn't mean once upon a time they left happily ever after. <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that. It means that the audience can follow your logical progression from A to B to C to D to E, yeah. et cetera. That's all it means. Yeah. It's that, that ability. Like, I, I find um, that storytelling works the best when your audience is realizing things the moment that you're enacting them. Like, it, it, it becomes that, like... Oh, okay, he's gonna, and then you do it. You know, you're, like you're creating an environment where they're having an empathic response with you. The audience, by their nature of the performance, is putting themselves in your shoes. Yeah. And if you know, and you can manipulate them putting themselves in your shoes, yeah, you can take them on this fantastic journey. It's amazing, and you can take them anywhere. Yeah. Now you, and you, that you, could make me a very bad man. <laughs> now you you talk about this a lot in um, yeah. in something that you've been doing more. Well, I guess more recently, within the past like ten, fifteen years, mm. you've started instructing more. Yeah, and we've known each other for twenty years. Yeah, and I, I mean, ten years ago, I was I was in one of your courses too, and mm -hmm. and one of the biggest. The emphases that you have, I would say, is on storytelling. Absolutely. Because it doesn't matter what you do if you can't present it. Yeah. 
if yeah. you can't make it interesting, if you can't suck the audience into your reality, get off the stage. Yeah, make it logical, make it understandable. Yeah. Yeah, which is, it's, I, I can't, like, I can imagine how difficult that is for, for different audiences, but that doesn't mean that it's impossible. Oh, no. And it's, to me, it's not language-based either, but that's yeah. part of it is because I have a very strong sense of movement, and so my body skills can... You can translate thought into action really well, which is a completely individual skill. Like, yeah. It, yeah. It, it's, I'm very fortunate that way. Yeah. You know, it's a certain kind of timing and body awareness and... That's little, something that... Little I, training never hurt. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure experience on the stage for that long, yeah. that develops that as yeah. well. Performing a long time. Yeah. So now... You had this this whole journey into becoming your own sort of type of artist. Yeah. Did we way. answer your question about oh, how I, I got into yeah, sideshow? Yeah, yeah. We I don't went, even we went see, on the I whole journey. Even, I don't. I, <laughs> sideshow is such a strange concept because the traditional sideshows are basically dead. Yeah. There are only a couple of them left, and and, and you know I wish them well. There are one bad one and a couple good ones, and I really like the good <laughs> ones, and I love the people involved. Do you have and, any, um, any good I ones that you want to shout but out or anything like no, that? I'm not saying anything yeah, about anybody. Right. <laughs> I love World of Wonders, which used to belong to, World, to Ward Hall. Ward was 80-something years old when he died yeah. about a year ago, and he had been in show business since he was about 15, Wow. Ran away and joined a circus wow. in the mid '40s, and um, he was called the king of the sideshow, with good reason. Uh, there was no one in the, the North American continent who had his knowledge or his breadth of his skills, and he was one yeah. of the most smooth talkers <laughs> that ever lived. He just. He could suck an audience into his reality from a yeah. couple hundred feet in a carnival midway with rides there and 17 kinds of music blaring yeah. around and, and all the know, distractions funnel in the world. cakes being there and <laughs> 47 games of different kinds with everybody yeah. arguing for attention. Yeah, he'd and get Ward, you to his door. Ward would just kind of stand there and you had to listen. Yeah. You had to listen. You didn't it was not a choice. You had to listen and then you had to buy a ticket. That's and awesome. He was very successful that way. Yeah. That's incredible. Now his show is owned by well his old partner still owns has part interest and does some of the booking. Yeah. And the show is owned by a young man named Tommy Breen, who's brilliant. Tommy Breen. You introduced me to him. I introduced I, you to Tommy. Was that the uh, he's a really good performer and he's an Really nice guy. Yeah, yeah. And they they came by the uh, Allentown Fair, which was, um, I mean, yes, we did yeah, a, a piece couple on months that. ago now. But yeah, they'll be back again, and definitely check them out. World of Wonders. World of Wonders sideshow. Yes. Yep. So you've you've gone through this whole journey. You've you've gotten you've become like super individual in in what you do, and then yeah. you you started instructing and you started doing this this sort of other side of of Sideshow to sort of, was it to help keep it alive? Was it to pass on your knowledge? Was it like, what was the kind of inspiration to go that route? I have a wacko magician friend named Rick Maul. <laughs> he lives out in Pittsburgh. And Rick is a brilliant businessman. And okay. Far better than I am. I'm not a great businessman. I, I know what to do when I have a stage. Business, that's not the same thing. <laughs> and Rick said, you need to write a book. You need to teach. Mm -hmm. And there was something else that he said I needed to do that I won't repeat here. Because there will be a lot of people who would try to copy it. Because people like to copy me for some reason. Yeah. And um, I paid attention, so now I've got a book manuscript that's not quite ready to publish. I showed mm -hmm. it to some friends, and they they said, "Oh well, this really needs to be three books." 
<laughs> and Jeez. I understand that now. I didn't at the time. It okay. Was, yeah. It's amazing thing. I'm thinking, okay, I want to write a book about the history of walking barefoot on swords, a tr traditional oh, stunt, wow. roughly 20, 25, 2600 years old. And I've been able to track it, and, and it's from where it started through how it moved around the world and the philosophies that encouraged it yeah. to go from one culture to the next. It's amazing. I've been able to track the people who came up with the stunt and what developed their thinking from a thousand years before. Oh, geez. Yeah, wow. So that walking barefoot on swords became a necessity to them. Right. It yeah, wasn't it was, just something it was a part to of do to show off. It was a, it was a crucial element of religious practice. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I took that idea and I did all this research and started writing the book. And then somebody said, well, you have to have parts of yourself in it. So I put that in. Yeah. <laughs> and then there was a lot more and I put that in. <laughs> oh, jeez. Now I'm looking at it and I think, yeah, I got to separate that out. And then I've got three books ready to go. So yeah, I've got yeah. three books ready to go. <laughs> and I paid attention to my friend Rick and I started teaching. And, and that's, that's Oddity You. Right. And uh, which you've been through. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's. Not too many people have been through it. Um, it's one heck of an there's experience. Another, there's another place you can learn Sideshow in a formal sense. And okay. All you have to do is pay them money. Mm -hmm. and go to their class. And I don't really care how much money somebody wants to throw at me. I don't want to people, I don't want to train people mm -hmm. unless I think they're going to do something interesting. Yeah. Like so I screen them. There's definitely a vetting process. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, you know, I get, I don't care if the people are going to become full-time performers that's not important mm -hmm. what's important to me is that I see somebody who's going to develop through this and do something interesting yeah and yeah. so far I'm really pleased you know there are a couple of people who in the modern sideshow are you know top stars yeah that I've trained and there are a couple of people who you know sit back at home and really don't do much very often gotcha. but I'm interested to see what they do and they yeah. do things that are intriguing there's, there's an individual type of creativity that they all bring to yeah. the art. Yeah. 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 Now, I, I don't want to kind of push you to pick favorites or anything like that, but are, are there any people that you'd want to talk about or, or bring up? I know well, there's... look at you. You first took, you took my class 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Having a completely different sense of the world, and I'd known you since you were a kid. Yeah. And I knew that you were performance oriented mm -hmm. I knew the that the drama were, club did music and all kinds of yeah, stuff like all that all of that stuff I knew you were a really interesting kid you know you had some twists and turns in your head that weren't there for most people and I sure. wanted to see what I could do to <laughs> nudge them along that's, that's and, a good way of describing it it's very nice of you and, <laughs> well you know I, it, you know it, my parenting skill I'm not going to claim to be the best parent in the world, but there's a thing about parenting that's really interesting. You know, you you, mm -hmm. you have to sometimes nudge your kid forward without them realizing that you're doing it. Yeah. And then there are times when you have to pull them back without them realizing you're doing it. And sometimes you have to do both of those things at the same time. It's a very subtle art. It's a very subtle yeah. art. So I was very aware that I really liked nudging you along. <laughs> You're good and, at doing uh, it too, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and look what you're doing now. Are you doing sideshow as such? Well, you're you're starting to get more interested in doing some old traditional strongman kinds yeah. of things. But oh, I have yeah. infected you with a different sense of showmanship. Yeah, that's for sure. It's it's the story. It's about making continuing things, and like yes. even in in like the video production and stuff that I do, that definitely shows through. You're doing video production. It's a co totally different kind of show, and yet it's not. Yeah, it's still you performance. You still have to tell a clear story. You have to suck the audience into your reality. You don't yeah. have time not to, yeah. especially because of the kind of most of the work you're doing is sort of news related. Yeah, yeah. You don't have an hour to develop it or an hour yeah, and a half three to minutes develop or it. You've five got minutes, three yeah. or five minutes, and you've got to nail that to the wall every single time. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been doing That's a really true. remarkable job. That's I'm, like um, I'm delighted to watch when we uh, when we did that piece because I'm still doing 
But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> when we did that piece for PBS, I thought it was really interesting how, like, how much my experience mirrored the reporter that came in. Yeah. Where she had experience with, you know, comedy performance and uh, yeah. doing improv and, and things like that. And yeah. this was just like a whole, like the, the storytelling arc that you talked about linked to both her creative side where she was doing like comedy and things like that mm -hmm. and her news reporting side. Mm -hmm. Like it just, it fit right in. Well... I knew we had a limited amount of time to do a good news piece. And I knew that the first thing you do in a conversation yeah. is not yell about the things that you have differently. Right. The first thing you do in a conversation is find something you have in common. Yeah, and find play the common with. ground. And we did that. And that was a really nice piece. It was a brilliant piece. That was well done. It was well done. You did that. I appreciate that. That was that was Haley that did the. She yeah. wrote that out. She did a fantastic job on that. If yeah. you want to check out that video, that'll be in the description below. That's uh, PBS thirty nine that was uh, broadcast that, and you yes. can find it online. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So now you were you were talking about um, a, you touched a little bit on the deep roots of sideshow that you've you've kind of delved into. Yeah. And with a whole bunch of different styles too like you you find yeah. the origins of these things well this this is where my insatiable curiosity for folklore and mythology comes into hand yeah and going right along with those is philosophy no i'm not going to yeah. claim to be a philosopher if you ask me what all the different kinds of fallacies are in philosophical argument i'll say oh that's way too sophisticated for me. <laughs> but if I see how the kind of mythology that a particular culture had and what they had yeah. to do to meet the needs of their environment and how that changed as their environment changed or their peoples moved, mm -hmm. then you know I can draw very different kinds of conclusions about what those cultures were and how they approached the world. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, having a, a psych background really helps in that, too. Yeah. Because I understand what a lot of people's motivations are. And we, oh, we're not like our ancestors. Aliens built the pyramids. Oh, go climb up your own ass. <laughs> you know, aliens didn't build the pyramid. These were people who had beliefs about the way the universe worked. Yeah. They saw particular kinds of problems and they were able to come up with these incredibly ingenious solutions to those problems. People are brilliant. Yeah. People are so smart. There also weren't a billion distractions back then too. It was like, sure we're going to do this or we're going to... Everybody had distractions. There's yeah. all, there are okay. always distractions. We're no different than our ancestors thousands of years ago. You know, and we just like to think we are. We're so advanced. Yeah, yeah. No, we're not. <laughs> we still operate on the same emotional backgrounds that our ancestors did. And we still have the same kind of problems to solve. We just look at them differently, you know. And Interesting. Okay. You know, instead of sitting around a campfire before we're going to go to bed at night telling f folk tales. Yeah talking about our ancestors or the gods or whatever we happen to be talking about, we look at the computer for a few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, our stories our, come out in Our in stories that. come out differently, but it's still the same basic thing of telling stories, yeah. fulfilling emotional needs that we have, being curious about the way the universe works around us and our mm -hmm. place in it. Yeah, those story archetypes are universal. They're powerful, powerful archetypes. That's yeah. a, an excellent word. And now, now going back into like stories like that, like a lot of these, a lot of the different sideshow stunts and 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 performances come from like religion. Um, oh yeah. There's mysticism involved. Like there's very human roots to these things. Yeah. And yet, and, and, and yet there are so many different. A basic skill might have so many different ways of presenting itself. Yeah. Um, popular story about sword swallowing. Oh, it mm -hmm. originated 2,500 years ago in India. No, it didn't. 
Now, 2,500 years ago in India, they had the most sophisticated steel manufacturing anywhere in the world, and the steel they manufactured in Kerala and Tamil Nadu, these, that steel got transported secretly, eventually, to the Middle East and became known as Damascus steel. The oh. people in Damascus didn't make their own steel. They got it from South India. And they're just now beginning to discover the, 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 the things they did in processing mm. that made that steel so phenomenal. Oh, wow. But we don't hear things like that. Did sword swallowing originate there? No. I have held a sword that was made of bronze in China almost 3,500 years ago. It was incredible. Wow. It was still yeah. so sharp. I could have gone like this to your beard and your chin would have disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. You know, and, and astounding. And, you know, and I yeah. remember this sword well because somewhere about, I don't know, a thousand years ago, somebody had taken this incredible bronze sword yeah. and inlaid it with silver and made this. Oh, wow. I wish I could have bought the sword. It was that's incredible. I yeah. had to sell my house and yeah, I didn't know what else to buy of that. What a heck of a historical piece right and then there. I would, and then I would have taken the edge off it and then swallowed it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and talked about the history of the sword because it was an yeah. amazing sword. But I wouldn't have told them what I was, I wouldn't tell people what I was going to do with it ahead of time because that would be stupid. That's incredible. Oh, uh, yeah. So, but, but look at the skill of sword swallowing. Mm -hmm. um, did they do it in India? Sure. In South America, for example, in the basin of the Orinoco River, there were peoples who had the same skill, only yeah. they used reeds. And because oh, of the rituals associated with their mythologies, they would stuff a reed down their throat into their stomach and pour concentrated tobacco juice down. Two oh. different kinds of tobacco, not the yeah. kind that people smoke here. But the stuff they would put, what they would pour into their stomachs would be so close to toxic that, you know, there was not necessarily a guarantee you would survive oh, wow. the dosage. Jeez. And so drinking that tobacco juice would make you have incredible hallucinatory experiences, <laughs> which, of course, we look at as being the ecstasy of religion. Okay, yeah. Go a little bit farther north of there into the Caribbean. And there were the Taino people. I'm not sure if it's Taino or Taino, T-A-I-N-O. I think it's Taino. And the Taino people, you can still see in the, in the uh, available for sale online, you can see their vomit sticks. Oh, wow. They had religious, habits of religious ecstasy using a drug called cahoba, which okay. is some kind of ground up seed. And, and they would eat it, and then they would take a a carved rib from a manatee and shove it down their throat to make themselves vomit. Wow, jeez. Yeah. If you went into Plains in India, and I hate that word, North America, yeah. there were a number of tribes that had sword swallowing fraternities. You know, wow. So you can't tell me that any of these cultures learned the skill in ancient India 2,500 years ago yeah, yeah. when there's a reasonable probability that their ancestors came to the Americas at least 15,000 years ago and possibly 30. Yeah. So when you think of that and you think that that particular skill appears in every other human culture mm -hmm. that we can track, then you start to realize that that skill had to be so ancient that it predated the migrations that spread people to all of these parts of the world. Oh, wow. That's yeah, okay. astounding. Jeez. That's just astounding. Which pushes that much further back than yeah. 2,500 years ago in India. Yeah, yeah, it's not India. Wow. It's not India. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And that's our, that's our legacy, but we don't think of it that way. It's a, it's a kind of storytelling. It's a yeah. kind of mythology. It's a kind of philosophy, and all of these things run, into, run together. And, you know, can you separate philosophy and storytelling and mythology? No. Can you separate it from religion? No. It's all, there are things we experience in our universe and there are things we don't understand and the, right. the area in between the the things we call science in, in our current language mm -hmm. evidence-based things there's an area between our science 
and all the things we don't understand about the world, and that's where our mythologies are and our yeah. philosophies. It, it sort of fills in the blanks from yes. our understanding to our belief. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. <sighs> wow. Man, that's a... Like, just the, the journey that you went through from, you know, a, a kid that didn't know what he was going to do getting out of college um, to a storyteller and becoming this, you know, having this whole journey through performance yeah. and into instruction and just this wide understanding that you've had of this of this performance art. It, it becomes, like, hyper individualized within you you know like you've you've got all of these influences from different places and and you almost become specialized in being the person that ties everything together like you can you can bridge those gaps from the extreme past to what makes sense with us now and things like you were you were talking about the um well i would like to think i made sense (laughs) well like like the the plunger routine Okay. Like being able to, to put it into modern context with these stories that have that have come from, you know, many, many thousands of years ago. Yeah. Is a that's a that's a whole it, it's it's sort of like a cultural preservation in a way. It is. It well we we talk about folk art, Mm -hmm. performance-related folk art. I mean, you know, there there, there are people who do folk art and they call it, and like, Paisanke, decorated eggs. Okay, yeah. The roots of that art form are at least 10,000 years old. Wow. And if you look at a culture in what's now the Ukraine called Kukuteni Tripilia, two names of places. If you look at the art from that particular culture, we know mm-hmm. that one, they had a set, they had writing that we don't understand. Rudimentary by the way we look at writing, but they had a writing system. Okay. And they had these artistic uh, themes that if you look at Paisanke or Hex signs, since we're in Pennsylvania Dutch country. Okay. The artistic themes are very similar to what people were doing 10,000 years ago. Yeah. 8,000 BC. It's astounding. That's wild. Um, So there is that continuity. If you look at something like these ancient stunts, you know, there is still that continuity. And if we're aware of it, and we're aware of ourselves as storytellers when we're performing. Mm-hmm. We have much more, let's call it range of motion. Okay. You know, you can go like this, or you can go like this, or you can go like this without yeah. moving from where you're sitting. Right. This is appropriate for one kind of story. This is appropriate for another. Maybe it's the same story, different phases. Yeah. But each thing has a different way of weaving together into this ongoing saga. Gotcha. And the way we look at stunts is no different. Or the way I look at them is no different. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I'm always looking for different things that I want to play with. Um, I will go to great lengths to introduce things, to give them their own life, if I think it needs, Mm -hmm. something needs it, a prop. To like contextualize it. Yeah, it gives it a context. Yeah. So let's say, okay, I got lots of magician friends. I'm going to put on this blindfold and you know it's real. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Shut up. Get off the (laughs) stage. But if I pull somebody out of the audience and I put the blindfold on them and I swing a sword screaming in front of their face because they're holding a box of porn flakes right here and then I pause the sword right here and pull the blindfold off their head and the audience sees them go, I've told a story. Yeah. 
I've introduced a prop as a character in a way, mm -hmm. and I've shown that the thing is real. Yeah, you give them like raw emotion to empathize with. Absolutely raw. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it can't be faked because it's not coming. It's can't not coming fake. from the performer. It's, it's coming from an audience member. That's really yeah. cool. And you know, I, I I I like doing that. Yeah. Used to cut the box of cornflakes in half with a chainsaw. It left such a mess all over the stage. <laughs> I've, I've gotten much gentler in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be a surprise. You're blindfolded and a chainsaw comes through here. <laughs> the thing that made a difference, oh, you know, one of, one of those stunts I really love is walking barefoot on swords. Yeah. And um, 25 years ago, well, almost 30, I used to have a whole routine where each sword had to cut something just to show that it was real. So one yeah, cut okay. carrots, one cut, I don't know. Somebody would throw a cantaloupe at me over my head and I'd split it in half and it'd splatter all over the stage. Yeah. And then one day I slipped in the cantaloupe juice when I was getting onto a, at the time I was doing a bed of nails with four nails. When I slipped and mm -hmm. I didn't notice that I put a gouge about that long in myself. Oh, and I was in performance mode. So you know, when you're when I'm in performance mode, there are a lot of things that are totally irrelevant, like pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the next morning, I got up and I'm taking a shower and getting ready to go. And I realize in the shower when I put the soap on it that I've got this gash. It took about six weeks to heal. Oh, I, I've had a number of injuries like that. Ay, ay, ay. And after that, I started thinking about, well, do I really want cantaloupe juice on the stage? <laughs> and I like, felt guilty because I was leaving, you know, chopped up lettuce and cornflakes and cantaloupes and stuff all over the place, <laughs> carrots. Carrots at least come apart in chunks. And, and, and then I felt guilty and I thought, oh, somebody else always cleans this up. And I didn't really want to be responsible for that. So I stopped cutting things up. Yeah. I found other ways of accomplishing the same thing emotionally for the audience that was dragged through, through a slightly different kind of story while still establishing the reality of every prop I was using. Gotcha. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's your, your finding a different way to create context yeah. without you know, creating yeah. so much extra work either for yourself or for the other the people that surround the performance. Yes. I mean... That's that's hugely important. Like being able to to evolve your act or your whatever it is that you you do professionally by making it more efficient. Yeah, is is like I feel like a lot of people think that they're stagnating by by just doing the same thing over and over again. They but are. you can do it by honing that craft well, too. Well, you, you 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 have to do both. Yeah, you know you you do the same thing over and over and over again because there's a there's a there's a function of doing knowing something so well. Yeah. Um, in my head, when I'm doing something really dangerous, and I have done a lot of things that are really dangerous, <laughs> um, I'm probably very fortunate I've never required hospitalization, and I'm probably just Jeez. as fortunate that I'm still alive. Honestly, I'm surprised Some that you haven't that I've done. had to be like hospitalized. Yeah. The stories that you've told me, I'm... <laughs> yeah. Oh, good lord. <laughs> yeah. Um, w when I'm performing, I, I, I have different, I, I don't know how to describe it a lot of times. It's like having different levels of awareness. Okay. Yeah. And on one level of awareness, I'm always going through strictly the technique of what I'm doing in a stunt. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, hitting the beats. I have to hit the beats. I have to get everything exactly right every single time. Okay. There's and and there isn't room for error. Yeah, you know, or I wouldn't be here. Yeah, and then and then there's the way I deal with the audience in a couple ways. You know, as individuals, as a group, the emotional experiences I want them to run through. Um, and and there are a whole series of different kind of we'll call them stories for the sake of discussion mm -hmm. that I have to weave together while I'm performing. And that's actually the part I like the most. It's not that I'm doing something for the first time or the, 
five thousand. Yeah. I, mean, I counted how many times I've been tied up in various objects <laughs> over the years, and it's, I don't know, fifty-five thousand or something like that. Oh my God. <laughs> Ropes, chains, handcuffs, shackles. Yeah. Garden hoses, electrical cords, straight jackets, and saran wrap. I mean, I've been completely enclosed in the tiny cocoon of saran wrap over a couple thousand times. I was gonna say I've seen I've seen some footage of you where it looks like you're just dying inside of a cocoon of saran wrap. It's an intense experience. Every single Jeez. time, yeah, with no room for error. Yeah, because like you, you do something wrong, it's I'm dead. Yeah, big cost. Oh, jeez. Yeah. You know what? Speaking about um, like like dangerous things like that, let's. I want to I want to save some material for. I know we're gonna have a lot of conversations in the future, and I'm really excited to to have those talks. But let's let's. Um, me too. <laughs> let's um. Let's leave the audience with one particular story from like a performance that you remember. Something, it was either an extreme, you know, situation or something, just something that stands out memorable, memorable to you. And then let's talk a little bit about what you've got next coming up. Well, we were just talking about Saran Wrap, and I remember for for a number of years, um, I bleached my hair. It gave me a certain on-stage look, you know. Now I'm gray. Yeah. I don't. I look that way anyway, you know, or something. <laughs> and I don't care. But I bleached my hair. I was very concerned about the image, more or less. My wife and my daughter said, "You really have to do that because it makes you look better on stage." And I paid attention to them because I don't have a fashion sense. You know, <laughs> my fashion is I don't wear clothing with logos on it unless the people have paid me to. Wear it. That makes, that's a good policy to have. That's a good policy. This is a marketable <laughs> thing. And I don't really care. I want to wear grubby jeans and a t-shirt or a long sleeve shirt like this because I can go outside and I can rake leaves. I can go into my workshop. I can grind metal. Whatever I feel like doing, I can do. Yeah. I can walk on stage in clothes almost exactly like this and I'm going to be comfortable. And when I walk on stage, if I'm not wearing clothes that I can destroy, yeah. I don't belong on stage <laughs> because I destroy my clothing. <laughs> it might take a while. I, I, I have a stack of jeans with gaping holes like this in the back from doing bed of nails stuff. And it's like, I can't wear them. I don't throw them out. I don't know why I should. <laughs> I keep thinking, oh, I could sew them up, I could patch them, but something. No, <laughs> just get, get rid of this stuff. <laughs> but anyway, we were talking about saran wrap a minute ago. There was one time I'd gotten my hair bleached. Yeah. And um, when I'm doing the saran wrap escape, actually, I want people who are wrapping me. Okay, basic, basic scenario. Over a quarter mile of saran wrap, people wrap me in this tiny cocoon with a snorkel to breathe through. My head is the last thing, so the snorkel is last. Yeah. Snorkel to breathe through, and then when they finish wrapping, they stick a cork in the snorkel and cut off my hair. I get everybody oh. believing that I'll be out in about probably two and a half minutes, and they all know how long they can hold their breath, which is usually a minute and a quarter to a minute and a half. And then at two and a half minutes, I'm not out. So people so start they to get see alarmed. this thing struggling, and it slows down and slows down. And about three and a half minutes, I slow down a lot more. I would chip over. <laughs> oh no! And usually about four and a half minutes, I stop moving. I've, I've twitched a little bit. Yeah. But I just stop and I wait. And I wait. Oh. And when five minutes comes, then I just started to decide when I'm going to come out. Yeah. Because I want to breathe. <laughs> so anyway, if people are doing it well, yeah. that cocoon is going to hold itself together and it's going to be a beautiful thing. If people do a lousy job of wrapping me up, and it happens sometimes, I have to be inside this cocoon holding it together <laughs> to stop it from falling off. <laughs> 
So this one time, I'm, I'd gotten my hair bleached, and the next day I had a show. Okay. And they did a lousy job of wrapping me up. So the air is coming in and out of this cocoon like, like a sieve, practically. And I'm sweating like a bit because it's really hot. Oh, God, I can imagine. Any yeah. lights go into the saran wrap and no heat it comes just out. Just retains it. Yeah, oh, God. You know, so I'm guaranteed to come out of it bright red. Yeah, covered no, in sweat. I measured, measured the temperature one time. It was 57 degrees outside. It was 108 inside. Oh. You know, oh. And that's 10 degrees <laughs> more than body temp. Yeah, Jesus. So there I am inside this cocoon holding it together. And all of a sudden there were fumes coming off my hair from having been bleached. Oh, and yeah. because the thing was leaking like a sieve, I could breathe. This doesn't happen often. Oh, no. But the fumes got to my head, and I turned to rubber. <laughs> I couldn't control any of my bodily functions, <laughs> practically, except maybe peeing. And, 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 and I had and it got me wasted, and I started laughing so hard, and I had to ask them to get me out. It was... <laughs> But that's an important lesson, too, because if you yeah. need help, ask for help, because it's better than the alternative. Yeah, yeah. Suffocating on hair bleach. Yeah. And there, there have been other times when something didn't go right, and um, if I hadn't been real clear, I would be dead. Jeez. You know, yeah, fall. You know, I've done... Straight jacket escape hanging under a helicopter. <laughs> done it from ropes that, that are story. on fire with a fire extinguisher and another rope that I have to get to. Yeah, and yeah. One time I didn't rig it right. And See, I, I think I know the story that you're yeah, well, you're you're thinking about. I want to save that for our next podcast. That's going to be a really really cool story to hear. Okay. Now, we've been working on some stuff together. We've got. All kinds of different content coming out. We've got some social media that we've been working on for you. Yeah. But right now, as of this this podcast coming out, you have a new website out. Yeah. Which is theharleynewman.com. T H E A A. I'm thinking, okay, I have to spell it out. T H E H A R L E Y. N-E-W-M-A-N dot com. Yeah, there we go. The Harley Newman dot com. You'll find a link to that down in the description. Definitely go check it out. I have to tell you, I did not come up with a name, but being the Harley Newman is totally <laughs> ludicrous to me. <laughs> I, I just want to laugh. You can also find him at bladewalker.com. Bladewalker.com. It'll lead to the same place because Harley's had that name for a long, long time. So yeah. you'll you'll be able to find some content under there as well. Yeah, because I walk barefoot on swords. Yeah. And um, because we mumbled on teaching a little bit, there's also odditu.com. Yes. O-D-D-I-T-Y-U.com. Link will be down there as well. Link will be there. Absolutely. Thank you so, so much you, for joining us. If you want to learn this stuff and you want me to teach you... I gotta have a good reason to teach you. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Harley, you need like a like a resume to <laughs> to apply to this. Yeah, you but do. At the same time, like it's it's very based on the person, you know. Like it's completely. Yeah, I, so I think it's really cool. You get a, an amazing crowd. Some of the people crowd. I accept have no idea how arbitrary my decision was. <laughs> Cause, oh, I can only imagine. There's a clue. <laughs> you know, when it, here's a main clue. Yeah. I didn't just start out as a clown. That was a fulfillment of what my reality has always been. Yeah. Somebody called me devious the other day, and I thought, wow. You're like, that works. That works. <laughs> well, Harley, thank you so much. This has been a fantastic time. We're going to have you on again Good. very shortly. And thank you for watching. This has been another episode of the FCMG Podcast with our guest here, Harley Newman. Another? This is the first episode, right? This is number two, actually. Number two. Oh. Number two. <laughs> Second. <laughs> I've always been told I'm number two, so you know. <laughs> that's a good thing. <laughs> two is not a bad thing. Yeah, it's not a lonely number, that's for sure. No. Peace, everybody. Have a good night.